So hello everybody and welcome to the 12th recap webinar. Today's webinar is entitled Climate Crisis and the Global Green New Deal. Our speaker is Professor Robert Paulin, Distinguished University Professor of Economics and Co-Director of the Political Economy Research Institute at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Robert has worked as consultant for the US Department of Energy, the International Labor Organization, the United Nations Industrial Development Organization, and numerous NGOs. He has also directed employment creation and poverty reduction projects in Sub-Saharan Africa for the United Nations Development Program. He has published widely and his most recent books include Green Growth, Global Green Growth, Greening the Global Economy, and the Climate Crisis and the Global Green New Deal, co-authored with Noam Chomsky. <clears throat> He was selected by Foreign Policy Magazine as one of the 100 leading global thinkers for 2013. Today, Robert will tell us about the climate crisis and the Global Green New Deal. The objective of the Global Green New Deal is to stop burning fossil fuels within the next 30 years and do so in a way to improve living standards and opportunities for working people. The costs of an action will be extreme weather, drought, rising sea, crop failures, and new mass extinction for many animal species, turning into an extinction risk for humanity itself. In the first half of the 20th century, humanity has experienced two world wars and the emergence of the most genocidal regime ever. Over the second half of the 20th century, we have lived with the threat of nuclear annihilation. Since 2020, we have been facing the COVID pandemic and uh, recently the threat of a new worldwide war. There is no time to be lost. Humanity has to join and fight its true global enemy, climatic change. Without further ado, Robert, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Claudio. I'm very happy to have this opportunity to participate in such a distinguished uh, webinar series. And I've seen you've had many other outstanding speakers. So uh, I'm gonna take as my title for the talk, now, the uh, title of my book, uh, recent book with Noam Chomsky, uh, The Climate Crisis and the Global Green New Deal. Uh, obviously, I will have updated things relative to the book, which came out in September 2020. Okay, so uh, speaking of updating, um, as you all probably know, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, came out with a report uh, just three weeks ago, the uh, second installment of their so-called sixth assessment report, uh, which is presenting this sta state of the climate and there's no other way around it, but to say di in dire terms, that's where we are as of right now, according to the IPCC. Let me just read to you from their headline uh, statement, their press, press release. Human-induced climate change is causing dangerous and widespread disruption in nature and affecting the lives of billions of people around the world, despite efforts to reduce the risk. People and ecosystems least able to cope are being hardest hit. And here is the statement from the chair of the IPCC, Dr. Lee. Uh, on the report itself, this report is a dire warning about the consequences of inaction. I think we should take that seriously. A dire warning about the consequences of inaction. It shows that climate change is a grave and mounting threat to our well being and a healthy planet. Our actions today will shape how people adapt and nature responds to increasing climate risk. So, our actions today, and I think he literally means today, uh, today, this week, next week, not four years from now. Okay, uh, uh, and here is the basic uh, picture of what we're talking about. Um, we are observing um, the uh, rise in the global mean temperature relative to pre-industrial levels. Um, and as you can see, this is showing us from 1880 up until 2020. Uh, in terms of the science of climate change, we've known about it for a hundred years. But in terms of the phenomenon of global warming, uh, what we see is uh, 
this period from 1880 to 1940, the temperature anomalies are actually towards uh, modest cooling. Uh, we only get persistent uh, anomalies of temperatures rising basically in 1980. I mean, we have these spikes before 1980, but you can see starting in 1980, the uh, anomaly is plus uh, 0.2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. And here is where we are as of 2020 at 1.0, but actually the report that just came out three weeks ago is saying we are now closer to 1.2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. Now here's when I say, and you can see what the headers I have, we're courting ecological disaster. Uh, to me, this is actually the most frightening set of numbers. Um, this is from the International Energy Agency, which as you all almost certainly know, is the leading basically institution uh, putting out data and big models on uh, global energy supply uh, and increasingly around issues of uh, climate change and um, CO2 emissions. Okay, so uh, in their most recent uh, study that came out, uh, their 2021, uh, or maybe it's even 22, anyway, it, it just came out. Uh, so they, they present us with four scenarios. Um, one is they're calling stated policies. Another is announced pledges. And three is sustainable development. Uh, four is zero uh, emissions um, by 2050. Now, uh, if we're, we're looking at actual emissions, according to them, we're at basically 36 billion tons of CO2. And if the world were to follow basically its stated policies, what more or less what they all governments are doing now, what we see is that there is no reduction in CO2 emissions basically at all through 2030. So by 20, through 2050, by 2030, we're still at 36 billion tons. By 2050, we're at 34 billion tons. That's where the world is heading, unless we do something quite significant in terms of reversing where we're going. Now, announced pledges, according to the International Energy Agency, takes into account all the things that a government said they would do at the Paris Agreement, at the Paris Conference 2015, and uh, leading up to the Glasgow Conference, which was just last November. And as you can see, even in this one, we have uh, emissions at 36 billion tons now. Uh, we only modestly fall to basically 34 billion tons by 2030. And by 2050, uh, where we are supposed to be at net zero, in fact, according to the announced pledges, according to everything governments say they are doing, will be doing, committed to doing, we'll st still be at 21 billion tons. Uh, the two other scenarios that the International Energy Agency has developed is what they call sustainable development and zero by 2050. So even according to the sustainable development, scenario that they've developed. By 2030, uh, we basically still uh, a modest reduction in emissions, 29 billion tons. By 2050, we aren't anywhere close to zero. We're at about 8 billion tons. And then finally, they have a zero uh, emissions scenario. And I will go through some of that in my own. Um, so the IPCC report of uh, last month, uh, followed up the uh, two previous really important studies. One was uh, from uh, just a few months ago, which was the sixth assessment report uh, installment number one. Uh, but in a sense, even more important was the 2018 study called um, 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming. That was the study that was really uh, the first critical uh, project of the IPCC to have insisted that we need to stabilize the global mean temperature at 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels, as opposed to the previous target, which has uh, been 
two degrees. Now, there are critics of the IPCC, which are saying that even at 1.5 degrees, uh, we won't be able to stabilize uh, the environment. But uh, let's go with that uh, goal for now, to hit the target of 1.5 degrees Celsius. And uh, what they are saying is if we fail to do so, as Claudio just described, we are facing intensifying risks in terms of heat extremes, precipitation, drought, sea level increases, and as Claudio just mentioned, critically biodiversity losses with the impact on our capacity to continue living in most regions uh, on the, in the planet. Now, what was uh, critical about the 2018 IPCC report was that it did set out uh, very clear targets for moving on to a climate stabilization path. If any of you have read IPCC reports, it, you know they present everything in terms of probabilities, ranges, uh, degrees of confidence, and so forth. And that's important that they do so. Nevertheless, they did uh, really boil it down uh, starting in 2018 with these targets uh, that we really have to think about cutting CO2 emissions by approximately 50% as of 2030 and by being at zero by 2050. And that's the framework in which the, what I just showed you, the International Energy Agency first sets out its net zero trajectory based on these IPCC uh, goals that they've set out. Now, uh, in terms of political discussions at the highest levels, we do have uh, the European Green Deal and the Biden program, uh, at least as it was initially presented some months ago, that were that are in, in alignment with these goals. They say that the, uh, both projects are organized around achieving these goals. Whether they are designed to get there or not is something we could debate, but they are recognizing that these are the central goals set out by the IPCC and they have a program, at least on paper, to get there. Okay, now what is the program as I would constitute it? Um, and I wanna stay with some very, very simple features of the program. The basic program has to start very, very simply with eliminating fossil fuels as an energy source. That's it. Uh, stop burning fossil fuels as an energy source, depending on, you know, there's various estimates in the literature, but we're looking at fossil fuel um, uh, combustion is generating something around 75% of all CO2 emissions. So if we're going to eliminate CO2 uh, emissions by 2050 and get a cut in half in only seven and a half years, uh, we have to have a plan to stop burning fossil fuels to produce energy. Okay, now, if we think about global energy consumption today, um, and I'll, I'll express it in, uh, in quadrillion BTUs or quads, uh, we can we could use other units, exajoules. Exajoules are basically the same as quadrillion BTUs. 95% of a one one quadrillion BTU is equal to 0.95 exajoules. So just think of it that way. And you know the world basically is operating on around 600 quadrillion BTUs of energy right now, of which uh, 485 quadrillion BTUs are fossil fuel energy, burning fossil fuels is responsible for about 80% of all global energy consumption right now. So if we're gonna talk about eliminating uh, fossil fuel as an energy source, very, very simply, uh, by 2050, we have to go from where we are now, 485 to zero. Now in absolute amounts, that would average out to about 18 quadrillion BTUs cuts per year for 27 years, let's say we're starting in, in 2023. And in terms of as a percentage cut for the first year, so we're talking at about a 3.7% cut relative to this baseline of 485 quadrillion BTUs. Now, of course, percentage-wise, the percentage is going to get bigger as a cut because our, our base is getting smaller. 
but it's it's misleading to think that the percentage numbers are blowing up because it's becoming more challenging. Uh, what we it's I think it's more clear to think of it as cutting out 18 quadrillion BTUs of fossil fuel energy uh, consumption per year. So that's 75%, roughly speaking, of the source of CO2 emissions. The other 25% is uh, due to deforestation and industrial agricultural practices. So uh, the other 25% of CO2 emissions really entail uh, transitioning from deforestation to reforestation and out of industrial agriculture into more organic agricultural practices that do not rely heavily on nitrogen fertilizer and uh, fossil fuel energy sources to maintain the operations of the farming practices. So I'm gonna focus on the energy system uh, today. Uh, if you invite me back, we can have another uh, interesting discussion on reforestation and agriculture, but I'll focus on energy systems right now. Okay, so when we talk about cutting 485 quadrillion BTUs of fossil fuel energy consumption, obviously we have to think of ways to replace that energy because we consume energy because we like the things that energy provides for us. It runs our machinery, basically. So as an alternative to a fossil fuel dominant infrastructure, uh, the, the, the clean energy investment program that I propose is the core behind what I'm calling a Green New Deal. And so it entails investments in two big areas. One is raising efficiency standards throughout the economies uh, in buildings, transportation systems, and industrial production. And so we will uh, contract consumption uh, while still maintaining a comparable degree of energy services. So I'll, I'll, I'm distinguishing here between energy efficiency and energy conservation. Conservation to me connotes more contraction of our energy services. And maybe there are ways in which we can do that. For example, I could walk to work or ride my bike to work instead of driving to work. That would be an instance of energy conservation. Energy efficiency would mean the building that I work in or the car that I drive in or the bus that I go in is much more efficient in terms of its energy consumption uh, than the ones that we have now. So investments in energy efficiency, I think have a lot more scope than um, energy conservation. So the second uh, feature, main feature of the Clean Energy Investment Program is substituting out fossil fuel energy and bringing in uh, renewable energy. And by renewables, I'm talking about solar, wind, geothermal energy, small scale hydropower and low emissions bioenergy, primarily solar and wind and the other uh, four are uh, subsidiary. So, and according to my own model, which I'm gonna go through the basics of my model in a second, my own model is that we can get an economy running on 100% renewable energy at high efficiency by 2050 through investing, investing on the order of two and a half percent of global GDP per year. Um, and in, in advancing this project, a clean energy investment project, we can think of this as an infrastructure industrial policy. It is a green program, but it is an investment program. And as we know, when you invest in anything, you will create jobs. And so a lot of my own research has been trying to estimate uh, the degree to which we get job creation through investing in this alternative energy system. And I'll show you some results from that. And it's in the, it's in through estimating these uh, employment opportunities, but not only employment, that we can have the expansion of decent employment, uh, that we can have small scale energy systems uh, taking over from massive utility scale systems. It's in that spirit that I think it's fair to refer to this as a Green New Deal uh, in the same way that the 1930s New Deal in the United States under Roosevelt was a program to get out of the Great Depression, but to do so in a way through expanding uh, opportunity, job creation, and, and 
raising equality standards in a cap within a capitalist economy. Okay, so I talked about renewable energy as clean energy. Uh, other uh, analysts uh, talk about other sources of clean energy, and I just want to mention uh, those and why I did not highlight them. Uh, the three that I'm uh, referring to are natural gas, geoengineering, and nuclear. So natural gas uh, is argued in, by some people as being relatively clean and, and a so-called bridge fuel to a zero emissions future uh, because through burning natural gas, you get fewer emissions than with coal or petroleum. So you get about 40% less emissions than with coal. So that's the basis for calling it clean energy. Uh, the problem is, number one, you're still getting 60% of the emissions that you would get with coal and we need to be at zero. So it's not a solution in that sense. And even beyond that, uh, in the production of extraction of natural gas, in particular through uh, fracking technology, uh, horizontal drilling, um, we have significant methane leakages in this extraction process. And when you get those leakages, uh, the overall impact on climate change, including methane, as well as carbon dioxide, turns out to be worse than coal. Okay, a second uh, alternative is what we call geoengineering at this point. Um, you could refer to carbon capture geoengineering as reforestation in, agri in an organic agriculture because uh, growing trees and operating organic agriculture, the trees and the soil have the capacity to absorb CO2. So in that sense, if that's what we mean by geoengineering, it can contribute to reducing CO2 emissions and the flow of emissions and also the stock of existing uh, CO2 in the atmosphere. The other, and you know, I'm, I'm not gonna be able to get into all of the issues around it, but uh, the other technologies that we are talking about with respect to uh, essentially capturing carbon, burning fossil fuels, capturing carbon, and either storing it underground indefinitely or uh, converting it into uh, recycled energy, those technologies to date are unproven at commercial scale, despite decades of effort. Certainly the fossil fuel industry has been very uh, supportive of developing carbon capture technology, and we haven't seen it working. Uh, and as we know, we don't have a whole lot of time here. We're talking about 28 years to get to zero. So maybe in the future, but I don't think we can count on it. The other potential clean energy source, nuclear, uh, does have some uh, merit to it, obviously. Uh, generating electricity through nuclear power does not produce any emissions. And that's why some very eminent, influential people are uh, in favor of expanding nuclear capacity. The most prominent being James Hansen, who's probably the most cl prominent climate scientist. So I respect their position. Uh, but I don't think that nuclear proponents, including James Hansen, have addressed the basic fundamental public safety concerns that we uh, know are, are still there with nuclear. We have seen it in the last couple of weeks in the war. Uh, what is one of the first things that Russia did in invading Ukraine was seize control at Chernobyl. Uh, the site of the worst nuclear accident in 1986. The spent fuel rods are, have to be cooled if the electricity malfunctions at Chernobyl, the rods can heat up and catch fire. Uh, two weeks after, or, or one week after that, Russia seized the Zaporizhia uh, plant, the largest one in Europe. Uh, they claim that they were not firing weapons near the reactors. According to news reports, that's not true. So um, we know that nuclear has whatever benefits it has in terms of zero emissions. There is no way, in my view, to get around these severe safety concerns. And we're seeing them right now in the war. The security systems 
in both of these plants have been compromised uh, as a result of the war. And we know once a security system at a nuclear plant gets compromised, who knows who can come in and do uh, very pernicious things. So I would just also mention with nuclear, I'll show you some data in a minute. According to the US Energy Department, not Greenpeace, according to the US Energy Department, to generate a kilowatt of electricity from nuclear is about twice as expensive now as uh, renewables. And on top of that, uh, the World Energy Outlook uh, 2019 did a, a, a cost estimate of going through a uh, what was then their, um, their sustainable development scenario with and without nuclear power. And their proponents of nuclear power, they're saying it has to be part of the solution. But nevertheless, uh, in their model, if we went totally without nuclear, their estimate is the high, the high end cost of doing so would be 5% increase in electricity costs relative to a transition without nuclear. In other words, as I would read it, a very modest impact of going, developing a uh, clean energy transition focused on efficiency and renewables. Okay, so let's talk about efficiency and renewables. And I know I'm cognizant on time here. We wanna save time for discussion. Um, so what you're looking at here are uh, energy intensity ratios for different countries in the world average. So energy intensity is basically energy, energy consumption divided by GDP. And literally what I'm uh, measuring with this ratio now is quadrillion BTUs of energy consumed divided by GDP in trillions of dollars. So the world average is 6.6 .6 quadrillion BTUs of energy consumed divided by uh, the uh, global GDP at about $80 trillion. Um, okay, and now we look at the range. We have China at 12.7, uh, uh, US is at 5.3. So some interesting cases. Uh, Germany is at 3.5. So Germany is um, about a little uh, less than half of the global average. And if we look at a couple of other comparison cases, look at South Africa versus Brazil, where they're at roughly the same GDP levels. Um, Brazil is at, you know, at one third the energy intensity level. So what these figures tell us is that there is a wide range for expanding, uh, for improving on energy efficiency over the course of the next decade or two decades. There's no reason why we can't assume that most of the world can start to look more like Germany's level of efficiency where Germany is today and not where Germany would be in 20 years. And that's kind of the idea behind the efficiency investments. And so the question then is how much does it cost to achieve efficiency gains through in the areas of transportation industry and buildings. So I looked at a range of, of studies and we get a range of investments. So I'm looking at these, um, a World Bank study uh, at, estimates a little less than $2 billion to get one quadrillion BPU of efficiency gain. Uh, well, you know, the classic studies by the uh, consulting firm McKinsey is looking at, uh, at projects uh, basically uh, in the developing world, Eastern Europe, China, and they're estimating 11 billion per quadrillion BTU. And the National Academy of Sciences in the United States, a little less than 30. So we have a range here between 2 billion and uh, basically 30 billion. There's gonna be a lot of difference. And I just wanna, I'm not gonna resolve that difference, certainly not today, basically not ever, but I'm gonna show you how I build it in to my estimate. Okay, so then the second, uh, the second critical leg of the approach is investments in renewable energy. And here we're looking at costs for renewables. What we see here in these uh, shaded, uh, 
these shaded brown areas or gray areas. This is the cost range uh, for fossil fuels. And this is estimates by the uh, ARENA, International Renewable Energy Agency. So we're looking at the fossil fuel range of cost per kilowatt hour uh, between five and 15 cents per kilowatt hour of electricity. And then these dots are uh, observed, single observed projects in these areas of onshore wind, solar PV, offshore wind, and concentrated solar power. And without going into, again, the details, uh, the orange one is the auction price, and the blue one is levelized cost of electricity price, the uh, cost estimate levelized over time. What we're seeing is onshore wind is at the low end of fossil fuels, right? It, this is 2010 to 2020, remains at the low end, relatively cheap compared to fossil fuel. Uh, what about solar? Well, in 2010, solar was way up here. Solar was about 34 cents per kilowatt of electricity, uh, but we've seen this dramatic fall in the cost of solar PV, such that solar is now also, solar PV is at the low end of uh, fossil fuels. By the way, these are fossil fuel costs average for G20 countries, including Italy. Um, and now what about onshore wind and concentrated solar power, or the, uh, I'm sorry, offshore wind. These are still relatively more expensive, but even these, even these offshore and concentrated solar power are within range now of fossil fuels. So basically, if we're looking at our main sources of renewable energy for the next decade, they are at cost parity or cheaper than fossil fuels. And here, now those are those figures from the International Renewable Energy Agency. These are figures from the US Energy Department, uh, where we've got solar at 3.3 cents, onshore wind 3.7, geothermal 3.6 cents, and here's where we are with carbon capture and nuclear, twice as expensive. A study that the arena came out with in June said that as of that month, their, their current study, newly installed renewable projects, so each of those little dots, uh, came in 62% cheaper than the cheapest fossil fuel alternative uh, for those regions. So what I do to try to model the, uh, the investments in solar is I take these uh, levelized cost estimates, which is levelized meaning over the lifetime of an investment project, and we uh, spread out the cost year to year, including the capital expenditures and financing costs. So that's what we get with levelized costs. So all I did was take the present value of the, of the uh, say the 30 year cost period and converted it through present value into a lump sum capital cost. Uh, again, if, if there's time, we can go through the calculations as you wish. But, and then I weighted solar PV, onshore wind, bioenergy, geothermal, small scale hydro. And here's the average to generate the capital capacity to generate one uh, quadrillion BTUs of electricity is at $109 billion. Okay, so uh, that's the other key figure that we're gonna use to do this simple modeling. Now, there are of course issues with renewables, nuclear and carbon capture, not the only ones that have issues. The issues with renewables is intermittency, the wind not blowing all the time, the sun not shining all the time, land use, uh, how, how we use the land and the constraints on land, in fact, I'm doing a study right now for Greece uh, in which the issue of land use is quite critical uh, because the placement of uh, wind turbines has been in pristine areas on mountaintops and so forth. So you have to do a lot better with land use. And then the third big issue is material extraction uh, with renewables and what the consumption levels are. So I'm also gonna put that one aside if there's time at the end uh, we can do, we can talk about that as you wish in the Q&A. Okay, so here's how we get to a zero emissions model. 
uh, here's my model, a very, very, very simple model. Um, I'm gonna take the growth rate of the economy that the International Energy Agency assumes between now and 2050, 3.4% uh, growth. I don't know that that's right. It, I'm taking that as an exogenous factor. So we have a 3.4 uh, growth rate, and then I calculate different levels of GDP, global GDP, at, uh, at, at where we are now at 86 trillion GDP, and let it grow at 3.4% through 2050. And then I say, okay, what about efficiency? Uh, we I think about efficiency in two ways. If we if we run an economy, a global economy growing at 3.4%, how much does energy consumption go from uh, the current level of uh, 686 quadrillion BTUs? And here's our intensity ratio of 6.6. .6. If we run the global economy at 3.4% growth and we maintain the same energy intensity level, by 2050, total energy consumption is gonna be 1,760 quadrillion BTUs. Now, as an alternative, I say, well, now let's run at a high efficiency. And how do we define high efficiency? For the purposes of the model, I just said, okay, I'm gonna take the International Energy Agency, the IEA Sustainable Development Scenario. Under their scenario, the global economy grows at 3.4%, but energy consumption contracts at 0.3% a year, such that by 2050, the energy intensity ratio has fallen from 6.6 .6 to 2.0. That is a quite significant fall. And we see it on in terms of the level of energy consumption. Instead of consuming 1,716 BTUs, we're all the way down to 512. So uh, this figure tells, uh, tells me that the first area of investment uh, is to get energy efficiency uh, dramatically down. It's the cheapest way, the easiest way to reduce emissions. Okay, now uh, then how much does it cost to achieve that level of emissions? So you remember we saw the range of costs between to, uh, 2 billion per quadrillion BTU all the way up to something like 30 billion. So I just took an average. I said, let's say it's 20 billion. Uh, and I can go through why, I mean, I think it's a high end average. Uh, most of you know, the, the high end uh, uh, energy, uh, the it, it savings is in high income countries, uh, basically because of the higher wages. But anyway, we're gonna, I'm gonna assume a global average that it costs $20 billion to get uh, one quadrillion BTU of saving. And so that therefore to get the savings through the IEA sustainable development scenario of one roughly 1200 quadrillion BTUs, it's going to cost $24 trillion. And then I divide it by 27 years. So we're starting in 2023. That gets us to 891 million. So that's the first leg of the project. The second leg is the renewable energy investments. And if you remember with that, that fig I showed you the figure, the lump sum average was 109 billion per quadrillion BTU. Those were US figures. So I'm gonna take an average of expansion per quadrillion BTU. I'm gonna basically double because I don't want to underestimate, I'm going to basically double the US figure for various reasons, because as we move on and we scale this project up, there will certainly be supply constraints. Maybe we can assume that uh, in uh, less developed economies, it's going to be more difficult to scale up. So I'm doubling relative to the US cost at 200 billion quadrillion per quadrillion BTU. And by 2050, we know now that we need to, under high efficiency, we need to get uh, 512 quadrillion BTUs. We already have uh, some, we have 26 billion renewable energy now, so we have to increase by 486. So then I just multiply 486 in renewables times the cost per quadrillion BTU, 
And that gets us to $92.7 trillion. I divide by uh, 27 years, and it's going to cost $3.6 trillion per year on average to install a renewable energy dominant infrastructure. OK, so that was basically the features of the model. And then just to show you how I got to 2.5% of GDP, the midpoint GDP, if we're assuming the economy is growing at 3.4% a year, the global economy, the midpoint GDP uh, is going to be 178 trillion. And our cost, on average, uh, efficiency renewable is 4.5 trillion a year. That ends up at 2.5% of GDP. That's how I got my 2.5% of GDP estimate. Very simple, straightforward. Interestingly, the International Renewable Energy came out with a study about nine months ago on getting to zero by 2050. Totally independent of mine. I had no idea they were writing it. I'm still not sure how their model works. But anyway, interestingly, what did they estimate the cost would be to get to zero by 2050? 4.4 trillion. Mine was 4.5 trillion. So we converge very closely. And in fact, the International Energy Agency's also own model is basically the same. There may be at, at about 5 trillion. So we're looking at 2, 2.5%, two maybe a little more of global GDP. According to a lot of models, I can't vouch for the other models. You saw how I came up with the numbers in my own model. Very simple. OK, now what about jobs? As I said, as we know, we invest in anything. We're going to create jobs. How many jobs? Well, the relevant metric is not just how many jobs, but how many jobs relative to what you're supplanting, which is the fossil fuel infrastructure. And myself and co-workers have been doing estimates of jobs through a clean energy transition in a range of countries. And here is quickly, just in terms of the percentage increase, we're getting a range of two to three times more jobs roughly per dollar of expenditure throughout the world. Why? Not because it's green investments. They're more labor-intensive investments. That is consistent. I've been using input-output modeling in, yes, global models, national models, regional models. Uh, basically, uh, these results are within range, highly robust to alternative specificities. And that's what we're getting. And then those were all countries that we're looking at are fossil fuel producers. I've also done studies for countries that are basically strictly importers, in which uh, I've done, as you can see, studies for Spain, Puerto Rico, South Korea. The South Korea study just came out last week, in fact. In all cases where these countries are all importers, we're looking at job creation through uh, building a clean energy infrastructure as opposed to importing at about 3% of their workforce. Uh, you know, it, again, this result was robust to the different countries uh, over these different years at about 3% each time. Okay, uh, so I'm running out of time. And uh, I'll just mention very, very quickly that it's uh, building a green energy infrastructure uh, is not just about getting emissions down. It's not just about job creation, but it is transforming the potential scale of our energy infrastructure in that we're allowing for much smaller scale opportunities, which is going to bring opportunities for alternative ownership forms as well, as we are seeing in uh, wind farms in, in Europe. Uh, and actually, even ironically, in so-called red states, conservative states in the United States, the Great Plains, where there are large agricultural projects, what we are seeing is uh, establishing um, wind turbines on this land so that you get dual income. You can still maintain your agricultural activities. And so you can also sell electricity. So they become energy producers. So uh, these are the opportunities. Uh, I guess I should stop. Um, we're at 1245. 
I will just mention that we can discuss in the discussion period as well. It's I painted a very positive picture. There obviously are losers in a clean energy transition and basically fossil fuel workers communities. And we have to be focused on establishing just transition programs. I, again, with, with co-workers, I've worked on these programs in different US states on different countries, including again, just recently in uh, South Korea. And then the uh, owners of the fossil fuel assets. Those assets are unburnable. We have to stop burning them and there will be losses. The losses are estimated, uh, a most recent estimate by my own PhD student, uh, Tyler Hansen just finished a PhD, estimates total stranded assets at about $14 trillion, uh, of which 3 trillion are private and uh, 11 trillion are publicly owned assets. But thinking about the 3 trillion that are private, privately owned traded, let's recognize that that is a huge number, but it's also not. If we think about managing our transition out of fossil fuels effectively over 20, 20 30 years, uh, we're looking at asset depreciation on average of $150 billion per year. Uh, and that's nothing, as we know, in our global financial market of 320 trillion or thereabouts, we're looking at you know, less than uh, one half of 1% of the market per year. So this is manageable. And I would therefore say, again, sorry uh, to, uh, I'm going over one minute, but basically the IPC stabilization targets in my view are realistic. We can get to zero by 2050 through clean energy investments in the range of two and a half percent of GDP and phasing out fossil fuels. In doing so, we will generate job opportunities, uh, business opportunities and cheaper energy as you saw. Uh, Renewable energy is at cost parity. When you add in high efficiency, it's going to be cheaper. So uh, we do need to think about the transition for the fossil fuel workers and communities. That's what I would call the core of the global Green New Deal.